It started off innocently enough, a blockbuster film about a planet run by simians, then became a movie franchise, a TV series or two, a reimagining decades later, and then when that didn't take, another complete reboot trilogy years later. In between, it's gained another life in parodies and memes, but it all began with the 1968 film Planet of the Apes. <laughs> Pierre Boulle's book, La Planète des Singes, which I was crushed to discover has nothing to do with the Eurovision Song Contest, translates into English as Planet of the Apes, which in the late 60s sounded like a really cool idea that would make a cool movie. So hey guys, why don't we make a cool movie about them talking monkeys? In his book, Boulle had a far-off planet ruled by a technologically superior ape society, while the native humans had become subservient and mute, purely out of apathy, which is a very typical boogeyman for a certain type of French intellectual of the era. The thing about apathy is, I don't know, I guess I just don't really care one way or the other. I mean, that's the thing about apathy. It is what it is. It's just not worth thinking about too hard. I don't really give a damn. When the book was released in 1963, various people in Hollywood took notice, with producer Arthur P. Jacobs eventually making the deals necessary to adapt the book into a big budget feature. Jacobs didn't want to make a cheap B-movie schlockfest with terrible acting and special effects. Well, not yet. Which is what 98% of science fiction movies had been. Warner Brothers were interested for a time, but after several years of false starts and trying to wrangle all the elements together, they still weren't there. Franklin Schaffner was interested in directing, and Charlton Heston, who was a huge star at the time, was curious enough to consider the lead role, just as long as it wasn't the title role. And also, if he could shoot something, then that would be great. What a civilization would be like where the evolutionary process had been reversed, and apes were the superior species. Still, the project had been turned down by every studio, often multiple times. Even Heston's name wasn't enough to get the picture greenlit. It squashes a man's ego. The closest Jacobs got to getting the picture off the ground was Richard Zanuck at Fox, but like everyone else, he was very concerned about dropping $10 million on a film about talking monkeys that audiences would laugh at. I don't go in for facts. So a makeup test was filmed with Heston talking to Edward G. Robertson as Zaius and Fox contract players James Brolin and Linda Harrison as Cornelius and Zero respectively. When the test was screened for executives, no one laughed. Just like one of the later episodes of MASH. The script had been worked on for a while, first by Twilight Zone creator Rod Serling and later by the formerly blacklisted writer Michael Wilson. There were elements of black humour, social commentary, satire, but no scenes of Clyde giving people the finger. The original budget of $10 million was too rich for studios, especially Fox, who would follow every hit with a dozen expensive flops. It truly was the general motors of the movie industry. A modern day ape movie with apes in sunglasses and suits flying gyrocopters would be too expensive, but if the ape society was more primitive, then the budget could be cut like a cake at a Weight Watchers meeting. At last, Planet of the Apes was a go picture, with an agreed budget of just under $6 million. So, Steve Austin minus a finger or two. The script was worked on by Wilson to tighten the narrative from Serling's draft, but also kept Serling's twist ending. Later drafts doled out less overt hints along the way to retain a you son of a bitch moment. What's that? It's when you're watching a movie and all of a sudden you leap to your feet and exclaim in a clear but annoyed voice, you son of a bitch. An Earth deep space exploration vessel crashes and the three surviving astronauts crash into a lake on some unknown planet. It was always likely to be a one-way trip, partly because of the way the mission was planned, but mostly because of the bullshit restocking fee. The mission is led by astronaut George Taylor, a cynical misanthrope who's about as much fun as a flat earther learning about Magellan for the first time. Taylor doesn't so much talk to his crewmates as lecture them, psychoanalyze them, and ultimately laugh at their misfortune, despite the fact he shares said misfortune. Yeah, that guy. You were the golden boy of the class of 72. Uh, give it a rest, Taylor. When they nominated you for the big one, you couldn't turn it down. Not without losing your all-American image. Damn it, Taylor, if you don't shut up, I swear I'm gonna deck you. They eventually discover that they're not alone. Oh, come on, a little class. It's not what you think. They're just looking at footprints. And pretty soon they encounter some primitive humans, who also happen to be mute, something that did wonders for the budget which after several days of trekking across the desert with Taylor bitching at you, the other astronauts were just grateful for the silence. Then the apes appear and capture the humans along with Taylor who cops a bullet in the neck, rendering him unable to speak, which must be karma at work. 
He's taken to Ape City, so named after its founder, Johan van Apenstein. Ape scientist Azira is amazed by Taylor's apparent intelligence compared to the primitive stupid human she has studied, which does show the true scope of Heston's acting ability. Can you love? Zira's partner Cornelius counsels caution in that ape society is very religious and quite strict in its policing of things like heresy. Their boss, the Minister of Science, Dr. Zayas, yeah, I know, you're hearing the song from the Simpsons parody in your head right now. Well, he's highly suspicious of Taylor and happy to cover up any evidence of Taylor's intelligence until Taylor briefly escapes and is recaptured by the ape guards. Take your stinking paws off me, you damn dirty ape! Well, the citizens of Ape City go well and truly ape shit. What follows is the ape leadership trying to discredit Taylor as a freak of nature rather than an explorer from another planet, or the alternative, the missing link between man and ape. Why do men have no souls? What is the proof that a divine spark exists in the simian brain? Huh? The ape society is not entirely classless. Rags he's wearing give off a stench that's offensive to the dignity of this tribunal. <laughs> I think I got away with it that time. The gorillas are the muscle, the chimpanzees are the educated class, and the orangutans are the ruling elite. But there is no place for man in this society. They are vermin, basically the same as people ringing you up at dinner time from Microsoft tech support, telling you that your Android phone has a virus. And like Microsoft tech support scammers, Zayas can see no human lineage. Tell me who and what you really are and where you came from, and no veterinary shall touch you. Cornelius and Zira escape the city with Taylor and his new girlfriend, Nova. I mean, come on. And they head for Cornelius's archaeological dig in the Forbidden Zone, and named after its discoverers, John Forbidden and Robert Zone out of the question. Zayas and his troops have cornered the party with Taylor finally making a case that technological man had a civilization on this planet that predated that of the apes. Would an ape make a human doll? It talks. Shocking, I know, but it's like when you've heard MC Hammer's Can't Touch This for decades and then you hear Rick James' Super Freak for the first time. I have always known about man. Smug git. He's the sort of guy that would tell you how he got into cold play before everyone else, but was also, more annoyingly, the first to say just how over cold play he was. Taylor and Nova head out to explore the planet and find more evidence of human civilization. But when they find it, it's one of the best twist endings to a film ever. You, you son, son of a, a bitch. bitch! This is Joe. <laughs> In very poor taste. Charlton Heston dominates the movie, in that Taylor is the major speaking human role. The stars of the film are the apes, thanks to the brilliant, groundbreaking makeup effects by John Chambers. Sierra, do you want to get my head chopped off? Don't be foolish. If it's true, they'll have to accept it. <laughs> no, they won't. Roddy McDowell as Cornelius would eventually become the face of the franchise. Uh, um, is he a man? Is he a deviant? Or a, a freak of nature? Zira, played by Kim Hunter, is almost the film's love interest. I'd like to kiss you goodbye. Though apes weren't naturally predisposed towards bestiality, or in this case, hestiality. All right, but you're so damned ugly. Maurice Evans' portrayal of Zayas is not quite the closed-minded zealot that he initially appears to be, but a fearful orangutan trying to maintain the ape way of life. Because you're afraid of me! What are you afraid of, Doctor? Poor. I think I will lay off the cabbage for a while. They bring their characters to life in a way that belied the primitive, by modern standards, makeup effects. If the ape makeup was to make or break the film, it made it. Linda Harrison as the mute Nova was probably the actor they least had to worry about them forgetting their lines. Charlton Heston's performance is also one of his best, or at least most fondly remembered by certain generations. In a film that's a lot more timeless than the historical epics and westerns he was known for, Taylor starts the movie cynical and basically, he's over mankind. I can't help thinking somewhere in the universe there has to be something better than man. Has to be. But by the end, he's defending humanity and proud of the fact that they have achieved so much more than the apes have. Things like clean diesel engines, friends, and Facebook. 
Heston would go on to appear in a few smaller but well-regarded science fiction films in the early 70s like Omega Man and Soylent Green. Silent Green is but Apes was probably his best known science fiction role. Schaffner's direction is on point. It's neither overly flashy nor workmanlike. It's atmospheric and dramatic. This is a film where the art direction was something other than just building another living room set. It builds a world from the ground up, rather successfully too. And Jerry Goldsmith's avant-garde score, with real instruments used in unusual ways, sets the mood perfectly. Either that or it's just a couple of drunk guys bashing pots together. Planet of the Apes was fairly unique for a science fiction film in the 1960s, in that there was a healthy budget, a big name actor like Charlton Heston, and it wasn't treated like a B-movie by anyone. And it was successful, making back its money very quickly on release in 1968. 2001 A Space Odyssey, released the very same year, eventually made a lot more money than Planet of the Apes, but it took several re-releases over a number of years to make that sort of bank. Apes also had a good reception from critics at the time, which is pretty amazing for science fiction in general. Perhaps because it gave them fantastic opportunities for puns, Apes hit it out of the park. Then ran outside the park, grabbed the ball, took a cab to the next park, and hit it out of that one as well. What are those things coming out of her nares? Hey, hey, watch my health! Space balls? Oh, shit. There goes the planet. At the time, Hollywood rarely did sequels for big budget films, but Apes became one of the first big franchises, and Fox would go on to squeeze the Apes for all they were worth, with four sequels, two TV series, plus decades later, a reimagining and a reboot trilogy. And some of those turned out better than others. God damn you all to hell! If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below, or check out some of our other videos.